um, okay, it's uh, it's wonderful to see everybody. Um, today we are very fortunate to have uh, Monica Edelsberger uh, joining us all the way from Munich. Um, Monica did her uh, PhD with Emmanuel Bloch. Funny story there, until about 2007, I thought Bloch's theorem was named after Emmanuel Bloch. So I will save all of you the awkwardness. It's, it's Felix Bloch. Um, what? Oh, also not the Bloch sphere. Is that also Felix Bloch? So you don't even know. I don't know either. <laughs> Um, history is not my long suit. I'll look it up while you're speaking. Um, anyway, so uh, Monica, um, you know, uh, is, is, is famous for her work during that period, demonstrating some of these uh, very early uh, works with gauge fields uh, for atoms uh, by making uh, super lattices in one direction and then in two directions and seeing atoms in magnetic fields and building towards uh, topological many-body systems. Uh, from there, she moved uh, to Collège de France and worked with Jean Dalibau um, as a postdoc, uh, studying uh, uniform Bose gases. I guess uniform here means flat bottom graphs, right? As opposed to harmonically confined. Um, but, but basically sort of honing these skills for really controlling cold atoms, not taking what the flying spaghetti monster gave us, um, but uh, you know, building the tools that we really want for the science. Uh, she has since moved uh, back to LMU where she runs her own group. Uh, and that's the work we're gonna be hearing about today, building uh, atom rays, uh, the ability to control and manipulate individual atoms. Uh, and CGM, and maybe we'll also hear a little about the turbulence. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah, good. Um, so you have two hours. Then I can say a bit more. Okay. Um, so, um, so she's won uh, a number of awards, but uh, as is my tradition now, I think instead of uh, really listing uh, the prestigious ones, what I what I've started to enjoy doing is listing uh, uh, what she's been recommended for on LinkedIn. So, so that includes things like uh, science and research. <laughs> Uh, and even Mathematica, um, <laughs> but, uh, as, but, but she's a recipient also of the Marie Curie Fellowship. This is where it gets hard. Princessin Teresa von Bayern Award. I'm not gonna try the last three, the last two. I, okay, I will. Alfred Group Jorder Prize? No? Okay. I can, <laughs> there are a lot of wonderful prizes here. So anyway, uh, thank you for joining us, Monica. We're really looking forward to hearing you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, it's a very nice introduction. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm very pleased to hear that I was recommended on LinkedIn for a science skill. <laughs> I didn't know, I didn't know that. <laughs> and um, yeah, so I will be telling you a bit of a story, actually starting um, from this idea of using quantum simulation with atoms um, in order to study uh, topological systems and trying to walk you through um, basically the steps uh, that took me to the research that we are doing right now. And at the end, I will say a little bit about the ideas that we have for our Ethereum lab, um, just on a few slides. And for the second hour, <laughs> she's right. kidding, okay? She knows it's one hour. <laughs> All right, so um, let me start with a, a more broad um, introduction on why um, we believe that quantum simulation is interesting to you. And of course, there are many applications that we have in mind for quantum systems. Um, they are very broad, they range from building quantum computers uh, using entanglement for uh, quantum metrology. But I think what all of these applications have in mind is kind of that we use many particles, interacting particles. Um, that we want to control very precisely in order to build interesting <coughs> entangled states that we can then use for something. And here is, I think, where quantum simulation can play an important role because having many quantum particles, individual quantum particles that interact and we control them um, individually, it requires us to first understand what the properties of these systems are before we can actually make use of them. And because that's very hard in order to uh, deal with classically, the idea is to um, build a quantum simulator. So what we want 
is take a problem of interest with some model Hamiltonian or, or something else that you're interested about. And because we have um, not the tools to study the problem classically, we build a quantum simulator. And that could be anything. So you could use atoms to do that, you could use ions to do that, photons, anything you like. Um, and the basic idea is then just to, to be able to engineer these properties microscopically and study it in the lab. So it needs to be a very simple quantum system. And this picture down here is uh, uh, an illustration of an optical lattice block that would be um, atoms that sit in, a, in an array that is generated by interfering laser light. Okay, so now before I'm gonna uh, start telling you the story about the H field and uh, what you're planning on uh, doing right now, I wanted to give you a sense of how our lab looks like and the efforts that we are doing in order to get this to work. And uh, so this is a very old picture. In fact, it's from uh, 20, uh, I don't know, actually 2019 or so. And uh, this is when we started building the C2 lab. So there's Tim, uh, which was one of the first students that joined my group when the table was still empty. And uh, so here you can already see a bunch of stuff. And um, I'm going to use this picture to explain to you the different steps that I needed in order to build a uh, gas microscope with single atom uh, resolution. So, this is a vacuum system, so you see um, a bunch of uh, stuff in the back over here. And this part that is wrapped in aluminum foil, so that's our oven. So that's where we put um, a few grams of cesium inside and then heat it up. Um, in this case, to so about 90 degrees. Uh, for a terbium, I'll have a picture later, um, we heat it up to about 420 degrees. So then what happens is that these atoms, they start to diffuse into our vacuum system. So there's this steel tube over here, so that's the Siemens lower. Here we um, have the first slowing down stage, so we shine in a laser beam that is counter propagating uh, to the steel tube that's near resonant. And then the atoms get a photon, they get a push back, so they, they get slowed down. And then we have the first uh, steel chamber over here, that's where we pull the atoms in a magneto optical chunk. So here again, we use a uh, configuration of laser beams from all three directions in order to uh, slow down the atoms, cool the atoms. Um, which happens, uh, the atoms get the photons whenever they uh, counter propagate with a um, with a laser beam. Now in this chamber, we get to micro temperature. temperatures. So there's another uh, cooling stage, a Raman cyclone cooling stage in the lattice, which allows us to cool the cesium atoms to about uh, one or two micro -cadies. So at this point, the atoms are cold enough such that we can use the AC stark effect in order to trap them in the optical potentials. And uh, because in the end, we want to have a long lifetime for our atoms and a good optical access, we move them into a second part of the chamber. Okay, so we actually have a second cell over here, which is fully made out of glass. And here um, on top, on, at, at the bottom, you see preliminary coil set up that we used in order to apply magnetic fields. Okay, so how do we move atoms from one chamber to the next? Uh, we make use of the AC Stark effect. So we create a standing wave. We have two counter laser beams. They interfere. They create this periodic potential. And the atoms sit in the minima of this graph. And now, if you detune the frequency of one of these two laser beams, this standing wave pattern starts to move. So simply by controlling the frequency detuning, we can move the atoms, um, like in these little buckets, from one chamber uh, to the next. And this takes about 30 milliseconds for the distance of 43 centimeters. Now, the final science cell, here we can reach actually very good vacuum conditions on the order of 10 to the minus 11 millibar. We further cool the atoms down to quantum degeneracy. And for cesium atoms, uh, that would be uh, Bose Einstein condensate. And our science cell is fully made of glass. So you see here these 11 side ports and the top and bottom window. And um, the size of this top window is actually quite tiny. So it's only uh, three centimeters in diameter. And uh, this is useful because we can now have an objective, a high and A objective from the top and from the bottom to image the atoms and manipulate it. So we can also produce um, high resolution potentials and protect it into the atom plane. And these side ports are used for various types of optical lattices that we use in order to trap the atoms. And um, now the, the only thing that you need to remember for the remaining part of the talk is that a BC is basically just a, a bunch of atoms, like a few million atoms that occupy the lowest energy eigenstate, for instance, of this harmonic trap. So it's a microscopic wave function that in this case would be the lowest harmonic oscillator state. And with that, we can do a lot of interesting measurements also of topology, which I will tell you more about um, on the next few slides. Okay, so these side ports will be used for lattices. For instance, uh, this four beam geometry with reflected lattices would give you a square optical potential in order to do science. 
Okay, so in this, at this point, we have generated a DC in the science cell, and that gives us the lowest temperature that we can achieve in our system, meaning that from there on, we try to be as gentle as possible to our atoms. To be adiabatic, we transform and load them into various types of other optical potentials, which we then use in order to do physics. <coughs> so in summary, the basic principle of generating then um, optical lattices is based on that. We use the AC start effect, we have a set of interfering laser beams, and then the intensity pattern will show up as a potential energy lag scale for the atoms. And then if you load atoms in such a square lattice, you can pictures like this. Uh, so I will say a bit more about this. So this is um, a bunch of cesium atoms that has been loaded into a square optical lattice. And using a high resolution imaging objective, we can uh, individually resolve um, atoms that are prepared in such an optical potential. So each one of these um, bright blobs corresponds to one cesium atom that scatters in this case, about uh, 5,000 photons, which you then collect on a, on a camera. Now, in this simple geometry, that would be a square like this, there are essentially two parameters uh, that govern the dynamics of the atoms that are loaded into the lowest band of this lattice. There's the tunnel coupling J between neighboring sites, and there's the Hubbard interaction parameter U that plays a role if more than once one atom sits on you know, each lattice site. So by just naturally loading, or by loading the atoms into such a square lattice like potential, we naturally implement Hamiltonians of this form. So that would have a um, Hamiltonian, where we have a Hopi kinetic energy term and an interaction energy term. Now, the main theme of this talk will be to uh, tell you how we can engineer more interesting model Hamiltonians that maybe do not just naturally arise when we load atoms into standing waves. Okay. So now let me say a little bit more about um, this quantum gas microscope. The way it works is as follows. Is, uh, as follows. So here you have the gas cell, that's our science cell. We prepare the atoms in the square lattice, which is here illustrated in the center of the cell. And in order to image the atoms, we make the lattice very deep. And deep means, in this case, um, about 300 microkelvin in temperature, such that if we scatter photons, and cool at the same time, the mean equilibrium temperature the atoms reach is smaller than the scrap depth, so that we keep the atoms trapped in each well during imaging. So essentially, you have a quantum simulation experiment that has your many body wave function, and then you freeze it such that the atoms cannot hop anymore. You scatter photons and then projects it onto the Fox state basis. So then you just count how many, how many atoms sit on which sides. And then you get uh, snapshots like this. So this would be a very dilute cloud of cesium atoms in the lattice. And from this, you can get a lot of information. You can evaluate the signal of noise, how many photons are scattered per atom, and uh, you can evaluate the point spread function of the imaging system. Now, what we actually want is have a large array um, of cesium atoms, the large systems uh, for doing uh, quantum simulation experiments. So what we have been doing is to implement a uh, box potential. So we have like a, a, a wall, a square box that we project into the atomic plane in order to uh, generate a large array of cesium atoms. And then what, what we get is pictures like this. So this is actually an array, two-dimensional array of cesium atoms, where we have uh, more than 2,000. So this is about 50 times 50 lattice sites. And um, the average filling is on the order of 98%. So this is not a typical like, selected image. It's really something that we can reliably do, these 98%. So this is actually very nice. Uh, but you also see that I was kind of lying a bit, or at least if I ask you to count how many atoms we have in this array, you would have a very hard time telling me how many atoms there are, right? So you wonder where is the microscope and where is your single atom resolution in this case? And um, the reason why I could show you single atom resolved uh, square arrays before is uh, because we doubled the letter spacing uh, just to have um, individual atom resolution. But um, without going into details, I just want to highlight and how we can reconstruct the density distribution of such an image. And the reason why it works is twofold. So first of all, it's um, not a random pattern. We know the underlying lattice grid very well. This we can calibrate, we know the lattice constant, we know where the lattice is. And from the previous image, I told you that we can also calibrate the point spread function of the imaging system. So it's a quite deterministic deconvolution problem, but on top of it, there's this noise, experimental noise, and we have a finite signal-to-noise ratio that we have to deal with. So if you look at this image, indeed, while it should be possible to use deconvolution in order to reconstruct the density distribution, 
it's actually very hard. So all the conventional deconvolution algorithms, they failed. They did not um, work in order to do the reconstruction. So what my students did, um, they picked up the idea of machine learning and they went ahead and uh, just threw the machine learning algorithm on this problem. And um, it turned out that this works actually quite out of the box. So there are a lot of um, functions that you can just use um, on Git. But there's one problem. So you can train a network. That's very easy. You know the point spread function. You know the grid. You keep in labeled data, and then it will spit out um, the, the site occupation. But this turns out to be not very robust um, if you're dealing with an actual experimental image, because you cannot quite simulate all the different features that you would need to feed into your network. OK, what's the obvious solution for that problem? You try an unsupervised machine learning network. And uh, the idea is um, as follows. So here on the left, uh, you see um, a certain area of our full CCD chip, 256 by 256 pixels. And these white points, they mark the lattice size. And now you get some uh, fuzzy image from your atoms. And the idea is to use an autoencoder architecture that makes a dimensional reduction in the tensor of sense. So what you want is you actually know that these are 16 by 16 lattice sites. So you let it learn this deconvolution uh, layers. So I think in this case, we have like four layers of deconvolution of kernels that move across the image. And then you need to restrict the bottleneck such that you allow the network only to learn on the 16 by 16 array if there's an atom or not. So you can force it to tell you it's either a, a one or a zero. And then um, it does the, the reconstruction. And, and this loss function will try to minimize the difference between the reconstructed image and the input image. And surprisingly, yeah. Can I ask a question? How large is the convolutional cell? Is it, is it 256 by 256? No, so it's, it's a smaller part. Um, it's like three by three. So because the point spread function is about two lattice constants, it was large enough so that it can see the leakage more or less. Right, and um, actually if you try that, of course we tried that first on simulated data, it works um, amazingly well. And then you try to do it on experimental data. Mm -hmm. And um, it was a little bit harder to get to work, um, but it's surprisingly, surprisingly nice. So here you see the training data that you need to feed in. And this is one subtlety about our experiment. So you see that um, we have various fillings that we need to feed in the network in order to learn, in order for the network to learn the reconstruction. So basically what we do is we do radio oscillations on some internal transition in cesium between the F equal to three and F equal to four manifold. And then we um, kick out some of them so that we have a nice continuous um, scan of the different fillings. And um, this is needed because we see that the brightness of uh, the image when the atoms are very close together is much higher than you would expect from just uh, putting the point spread function on each individual side and summing up. And the reason for that is that the imaging wavelength is 852, and the distance is very small. It's uh, 767 halves, so it's like 380 nanometers. So there's a lot of collective light uh, phenomena during the emission. And this gives you a density-dependent brightness, which is a nightmare if you want to do a reconstruction of the image. But the network can actually learn that. And so we found um, that this is much more robust com uh, compared to uh, imperfections, so changes in the brightness level of our images, and it can capture these collective phenomena. And uh, indeed, what we get is then um, arrays like that. So this is an input image that we feed into the network, and then this is a reconstructed one. And uh, this is just very briefly the idea of how this is supposed to work. Now, there's a lot that we can discuss about how to be able to trust uh, this reconstruction. I mean, still in the end, it's a black box that gives you an array of zeros and ones. Um, we have spent quite some time analyzing this, uh, doing double images and looking at differences between the double images to get the, the errors and so on. And um, what we get is reconstruction fidelities for the worst case of a homogeneous filling of 0 0.5 of about um, 96% for the reconstruction fidelity, um, which is really good if you think that the point spread function is twice um, the lattice constant in, in our case. So we are quite happy with that. And um, just to show you a last picture, this is how the experiment looks now, or part of it. Essentially, um, here in the back, you cannot really see it. There's a tiny glasser, the one that I showed you before. And all this bunch of optics around is now for super lattices and um, lasers, the tunneling beams. 
And um, there's also like a, a coil cage. So we have spent quite some time to do magnetic field compensation um, in order to reduce noise, uh, which in our lab is like 20 milligrauss to less than 100 microvolts. We spent quite some time in doing magnetic field compensation so that we can work with the internal states as well. So there's a lot of engineering that went into this machine, um, but now we are quite happy um, that it's working and that we have these nice large arrays of atoms to do physics with it. All right, so this is about the cesium lab and um, what we built. Now the question is, what do we actually want to do with it? So what do we want to simulate? And here, I just want to briefly tell you the two big types of experiments um, that we are interested in. So one of the um, studies that one could do in these quantum simulators is study ground state phase diagrams. So here's a picture um, that I've taken from uh, Marcus's experiment where they have looked at antiferromagnetic uh, correlation in a filling uh, one half Fermi Hubbard model. Now, in this case, the idea would be that you engineer Hamiltonian and you adiabatically try to prepare the ground state of the system as a low enough temperature as you can get. And then you study as a function of the parameters of the model what the properties of the phase diagram are. The second type of experiment uh, works slightly differently. So there, the idea is uh, that you prepare certain initial states with low entropy that you know how to prepare very well. And then you study quench dynamics. So you suddenly let the state evolve according to a Hamiltonian that you can engineer in the lab. And this is a picture um, that I've taken from Emanuel's lab. Um, where I've looked at thermalization dynamics in the presence of this order. So here you see the initial state is prepared in half of the system. In this case, it was a one trap. And then you let it evolve as a function of time and ask if the system thermalizes or not. And if the system thermalizes, it would fill the whole system it can evolve to. If there's this order, it would remain stuck in, in one half of the system. So these are the main uh, two types of experiments um, that we are interested in. And in both cases, the question is, what types of Hamiltonians uh, can you engineer? So what uh, can your simulator do? And um, so one topic that I've been interested uh, in for a very long time now is to study topological phases of matter. And these are examples that do not naturally appear if you just load the atoms into such a standing wave potential. So you get band structures, but in, in most cases, they are not particularly interesting from a topological perspective. And the techniques that we have developed over the years were inspired by the idea of studying integer and fractional quantum Hall systems. So let me just briefly remind you um, what an integer quantum Hall system is about. So here, that's um, just a schematic illustration of a whole bar geometry. You have a two-dimensional electron gas using the current through the sample, and then in solid state, what you can do is you can measure voltages, transfer voltages, and longitudinal voltages. And um, what happens if you cool the system down to low enough temperatures and apply strong external magnetic fields is that you get a deviation from the classical behavior where the transverse Hall resistance increased linearly with the applied field. In the integer quantum Hall regime, what you find is that these additional plateaus. And these additional plateaus, uh, they are governed by the topological properties of the energy bands. So the idea is um, really quite simple. You look at your system, you have an, a non-interacting band structure, and there's a topological invariant that you can compute for each band, that's the churn number, which here is labeled as mu. And this gives you the value of the plateau that you would find in this transverse Hall resistance. And then um, it only depends on this integer quantity, uh, the churn number, and natural constants. OK, so why is that interesting? Um, well, if this is the, the quantity that determines the value of the whole plateau, um, what makes it interesting is that it's very reproducible and can be measured within a few parts uh, per million. So this is also the reason, as you know, probably, which um, why it's used now in the redefinition of the SI units, which is something that can be measured very reliably and um, does not really depend on the details of your, of your sample. Now, these phenomena become even more interesting in the, uh, in the case of interacting systems, where due to interactions, you have fractional uh, plateaus that arise in, in this plot. So this is what we are eventually interested in, but I'm gonna tell you uh, first the non-interacting story and how we can make common models um, more interesting and uh, topological in, in our charging collecting system. The way we realize it is using periodic gravity. 
since we are loading the atoms in the, in the lattice, in the Hubbard model, we have full control over the individual parameters of the model. So we can also vary them as a function of time. And uh, this allows us to engineer, engineer new types of Hamiltonians by making use of Floquet's theorem. So what you see here is a Hamiltonian that is time dependent, and the period is given by capital T. And if we choose the driving frequency to be very large compared to the other parameters of the model Hamiltonian, in essence, what happens is that the atoms see some average dynamics, an average Hamiltonian. So the easiest uh, picture to have in mind would be um, a rotating saddle potential. So you know that a saddle potential in principle is not stable. You cannot trap anything there. But if you start to rotate it, um, then the party sees some effective uh, potential. So you can get a 2D uh, trapping geometry if you rotate the saddle potential. And this is a bit what you can have in mind in order to understand why this periodically driven system leads to new Hamiltonians. And more formally, this would be described by Floquet's theory. So you can write down the time evolution operator after one period of the drive. And for this one period, you can define this new Floquet Hamiltonian that is time independent. And now if you look at the system stroboscopically, so after integer multiples of this driving period T, it looks as if the system would behave according to this time independent Floquet Hamiltonian H. That's the basic idea. And now this HF uh, would depend on the <coughs> protocol of your periodic modulation. And then you can engineer the different types of Hamiltonians just by finding the suitable driving protocol and, and specifically you can make the band structure topological. Something to keep in mind is that in this periodically driven system, now you have a quasi energy spectrum. So if in fact this HF Hamiltonian, which you want to engineer is a two band model, you can go ahead and diagonalize HF. This would give you these two bands, one blue and one orange one. But because it's time periodic, um, the eigenenergies are only defined up to integer multiples of h bar omega. So you have actually a series of copies of these two band structure. And this gives rise to new uh, properties, which, which I will tell you about in, in a bit. OK, so let me briefly um, give you the definition of the Chern number of the energy band. So the Chern number is the topological invariant governing the properties of the band, and it's the integral over the very curvature. And the very curvature is a local uh, quantity that tells you how the eigenstates, the um, energy eigenstates, wind as a, as a function of quasi-momentum qx and qy. So you can really think about it as, as a local curvature of this energy landscape that is defined with respect to the um, eigenstates. And if you integrate over this whole curvature, you get the topological invariant of the band. And uh, just to highlight, so there have, has been a number of techniques uh, that have been developed in quantum simulation experiments to map out this very curvature. And here's an example from the Hamburg team where they have used a Fermi gas in a hexagonal lattice in order to uh, map out the very curvature as a function of quasi momentum Qx and Q1. And then the only thing in order to get a topological invariant you need to do is uh, sum up all of these values and this gives you the Chern number of the band. Okay, and in a, in a more uh, abstract way, so I'm, I'm sure you have seen these pictures in, in some form or, or the other, I just want to give you my, my take on this. So this is often compared to uh, geometric objects and how to classify them in terms of their genus or the number of holes in the surface. And uh, this is a quite good picture to keep in mind, in my opinion, because it shows you the connection between um, a local curvature that you can define on the surface, which in our case would be the very curvature, and uh, the global invariant that characterizes the surface, which would be the genus in this case, or the integral over the very curvature, which is the churn number in the case of energy band. And in order to change uh, the topology of an energy band, you need to do uh, something more, more violently, violently to your system. If you just change the parameters of your Hamiltonian a little bit, the topological invariant would remain the same. But if you have a gap closing point in the spectrum, it can actually change uh, the topology of the band. All right, so let's go back to the integer quantum Hall effect. And let me just briefly tell you um, how we can see that in an actual quantum simulation experiment. OK, so what we want is something similar to the solid state example. So we have this whole bar geometry. We have a current that is sent through the sample. And uh, we want to look at the transverse Hall voltage. And the question is, if there's anything that we can do similar in our ultra-coiled atom system. OK, so 
how does that work? Uh, so essentially what we can do is we can load our cold atomic cloud into the band structure. And the equivalent of the solid state transport measurement would be that we apply a tilt to our cloud. So we apply a force in one direction, and then we ask how the atoms move. So we take in situ snapshots of the cloud and ask what happens as a function of time. So in the presence of this force, in the direction of the force, the atoms would undergo periodic block oscillations. So due to the periodic potential, there's no net motion in the direction of the force. But in the presence of this non-zero uh, barrier curvature, the atoms can move um, sideways. So there's an anomalous hall velocity due to this non-trivial uh, geometric structure of the band. So if you take snapshots of our cloud, what happens if you take a apply a force in one direction, the atoms start to move sideways. And from this uh, sideways motion of the center of mass, we can extract the churn number. And specifically in the case where the uh, full band is occupied, so all the quasi momenta are occupied, um, we essentially get a center of mass motion by averaging over this area curvature, which is the definition of the churn number. And uh, this is basically summarized here. So the sideways motion is linear as a function of time. And from the slope, we can extract the churn of the band. And this is how such a measurement uh, would look like. Um, you start um, at t equal to 0, and you follow this linear behavior of the sideways motion. And from the slope, you can fit the churn number of the band. OK, so this is basically to set the stage and tell you that we can use periodic driving in order to engineer non-trivial uh, topological band structures. The question is, uh, can we do something that goes beyond uh, just mimicking integer quantum Hall system? Since we have control over our system, maybe we can study something that does not have any analog or simple analog in solid state. And so let me just uh, briefly summarize. So this engineering, this Fouquet engineering technique was meant uh, to mimic quantum Hall systems. And um, there's this correspondence between the bulk and the edge state properties. So if the churn number of the bands is non-zero, you also know that if you put boundaries um, on the system, there are topological edge modes in the system. And usually it's enough to just compute the churn numbers. This will also tell you how many edge modes you have at the boundary of a system. However, in periodically driven systems, um, that does not have to be the case. So here's again a Fouquet energy spectrum where we have two bands and um, the edge modes are shown in red or the dispersion of the edge modes is shown in red. And now because we have this infinite copies of the Fouquet energy band structure, there can be edge modes that wrap around the Fouquet brewing zone. And the correspondence between edge modes and churn numbers is actually that the churn number is given by the number of edge modes or the difference between the edge modes above and below the band. So in this case, you have one minus one gives you zero. So the churn number of this band would be equal to zero. So in periodically driven systems, and you, if you go away from the high frequency limit, you can have a situation where you have topological edge modes although the churn number of the band vanishes. And this is interesting because it's expected to be um, to have different properties, for instance, when it comes to disorder and imperfections. And this is actually something that we can also study in our system. So we can introduce control disorder by, for instance, projecting an optical spectral potential on our atomic cloud. OK, so you need new topological invariants and they are called winding numbers. So the winding number just gives you the number of edge modes in a specific gap. And it depends on the driving protocol um, that you're implementing. Okay, so how can we realize something like that? So just we have done in a hexagonal optical lattice. And the idea is to modulate the strength of the tunnel coupling. So this is shown here in red. We can simply enhance the tunnel coupling along the red bonds and then uh, change it in a current manner as a function of time. And this is rather straightforward to do. So the hexagonal lattice is generated by interfering three laser beams under 120 degrees. And if we imbalance uh, these intensities, so in the homogeneous case where all intensities are the same, you get a homogeneous graphene dispersion. If you imbalance the in intensity of one of them, you enhance tunneling along one specific direction. And if you then uh, modulate these intensities in, uh, in a periodic way, so out of phase by two pi over three, then you get this current modulation of the tunnel couplings along the different bonds. And now as a function of the modulation parameters, the frequency and the amplitude, you can look at the spectrum that you get. So in a high frequency regime, so just the modulation amplitude and modulation frequency, you get a more conventional quantum Hall type band structure, meaning that you have two bands um, with non-zero churn number, 
and edge modes around zero energy. If you decrease the modulation frequency, what happens is that there's actually a gap closing point because you're moving these Fouquet copies closer into each other and there's a gap closing point between Fouquet zones. So this changes the channel of the band and generates a new edge mode that is at the edge of the Fouquet zone boundary. So in this case, the channel is actually zero, but we still have to blot the edge mode. And that's exactly this anomalous Fouquet to blot the phase um, that I mentioned in the beginning. And then as you decrease the frequency further and further, there are more phase transitions because you move more and more Fouquet copies into each other. Okay, so we can actually study the system. So we can uh, modulate um, these parameters and we can, for instance, probe where the topological phase transitions happen by measuring the gap between the Fouquet bands. And these gap closing points would then signal where the uh, topological phase transition happens. So when delta E is equal to zero. And here's one example of such a, a spectroscopy measurement. So we uh, tracked the gap closing points. So they, they happen here and here, for instance. And uh, the solid line is an up initial calculation. So the only parameter that goes in is the calibration of the letter step. And then we simply compute uh, the energy gap and overlay it with our experimental data. So there's no free fit parameter or anything. It's really just calculating the energy gap and overlaying it with the experimental data. So this periodic driving technique really works um, very beautifully. Um, as a function of these different modulation parameters. And this allows us to map out where the topological phases are, which ones. And we can actually also go ahead and use these local hole measurements in order to map out the very curvature <coughs> and how it changes across the phase transition. So this we have done um, in this paper from 2020. I'm not going uh, through the details right now. What I actually want to tell you is how we can see the topological edge modes, because um, I told you a lot about how to characterize the channel of the band and the very curvature. Uh, but the question would be, uh, can we actually also see the topological edge modes? And if you think about our system, that's actually not straightforward to do because typically the atoms are in a harmonic trap. So we have these standing waves in order to make uh, the interference pattern, but there's also the Gaussian envelope, which gives a harmonic trap for um, the atoms. So there is no such thing as a sharp boundary uh, between the system and vacuum. And what people have done uh, previously in order to look at what happens at the edge is to uh, build systems in synthetic dimensions. So here the idea is that you have a real space dimension and one real space dimension is replaced by internal states of the atom. So here, in this case, it's uh, ethorbium. So you have MF minus five half, minus one half and plus three half, which you can couple by laser beams. And this gives you then um, on top of this real space lattice axis, a second uh, lattice axis, which is made of these internal states. And uh, because it's internal states, there's a natural cutoff, right? You can maybe couple three states, maybe five, in the case of this prosium, even 16, but then you reach a hard wall. And this allows you to study edge phenomena. So these are the skipping orbits. If you prepare um, an initial state that is localized on one edge of the synthetic dimension axis. Now, in order to do that in a true a uh, real space 2D system. What we did is to use a digital micromirror device in order to project a hard wall onto our system. So we have this uh, DMD, we have 638 nanometer light, which if we shine it onto the atom, will give us a repulsive wall. And then we have an additional tweezer beam where we generate a uh, PC in real space that we can move uh, to any location within the lattice and we can move it also close uh, to the hard wall, to the edge of the system. So this would look like this. We have our hexagonal lattice with the edge, and then we can move the BEC close to the edge and let it expand and uh, let it evolve as a function of time. And for this uh, system, the, the width of the edge is from, given by our NA, which is uh, 0 0.5, so it's about two to three lattice sides in, in sharp. So is that the physical width, or that's the width over which it goes? Because you could make it sharper by making it deeper. So um, we did actually study that um, also uh, because, but it does change. So the uh, dispersion of the edge mode also depends on the on the slope. So depending on where you are with your potential relative to the band gap, where the edge mode of the dispersion, uh, where the dispersion of the edge mode is, you, you get different velocities. So you can actually tune the velocity by changing the shape of the wall and the height of the wall. Okay, so this is um, uh, how the experiment looked like. So we have here this dashed line, which indicates where we project 
the repulsive wall. And uh, we move the wave packet close to the repulsive wall, and that's just an in situ snapshot of the BEC. And now if we let it evolve as a function of time, so you see down here that's a scale bar of 10 lattice constants, we see that it does not uh, just spread into the bulk, but it starts to evolve um, along the edge of the system. And if we change the chirality of the modulation, which changes the direction of the edge mode, you see that it um, still moves along the edge of the system, but it starts to move in the opposite direction. And this is really not processed data, so that's just raw data taking snapshots of the cloud. We did not subtract anything that would scatter into the bulk. And if you take the different images, you nicely see that it uh, goes along one or the other direction. And um, what I like most is uh, this example where we make it move around the outside of a repulsive disk. So you see that here in the center, the circle, this is blocked by a repulsive wall, and the atoms move around the outside of this disk. So it's not like a bucket where it moves inside, but it actually goes around uh, the outside of the bucket. And we can also change the direction and uh, look at the two uh, different chiralities, and you see that it very nicely follows the circular shape um, of the disk. And yeah, so now there's actually a lot you can play around with um, that we did. So you can change the, the shape of the edge, the height of the edge. Um, we also started looking at, we don't know yet what it's useful for, but we started to make it in the quantum point context. So you can make the edge go to a quantum point contact into a split, so you get um, split edge, edge states that uh, move along two different um, edges. And so yeah, it's, uh, it's something to play around with um, in, in the future. <coughs> and what we have added recently is a spectral potential to look at this uh, physics in the presence of disorder. In, in the lattice. Okay, so this brings me to the outlook and what I think will be interesting to do in the future. And um, so this is the topic of simulating that stage theories. And let me just motivate it very briefly by saying that um, I spend a lot of time uh, using these periodic driving techniques in order to emulate um, magnetic fields. Um, if you think about um, electromagnetic fields, there's of course something missing to that story because now um, our charge neutral atoms, they behave like charged particles in a magnetic field, but they do not generate any fields by themselves. So if the particles move around, um, it's not like they, they were associated with charges and would um, change an, an electric field by moving around. So somehow there's a key ingredient missing if we want to simulate something a bit more, more complicated. And um, this brings us to the topic of gauge theories and the basic idea it's actually that now you have matter fields uh, that live on your lattice, they can move around. This is very similar to the atoms that hop around in the Hubbard model. But on the links, uh, you have <coughs> fields or um, you have states or particles that implement the degrees of freedom of a field, for instance, an electric field. And this basic structure of a lattice gauge theory, you can find in many different areas of physics. So implementing uh, something like that would allow us to not only study for this matter type Hamiltonians, but also study phenomena that we know from high energy physics. Uh, for instance, we could look at things like string breaking or confinement. And so this Hamiltonian looks very similar to Hubbard models. And the question is, why is it so challenging actually to implement this in the lab? And uh, the reason is that, that we need uh, these additional degrees of freedom. So we have the separation between matter and gauge fields. And in specifically, we would like the matter to be fermionic. And um, what is new is that we need local symmetries. So if you think about um, having charges that move around in this optical lattice and electric fields that live on the links, there's a very specific rule that describes the interaction between them, which is Gauss law. So you want that if a charge pops to the neighboring side, the electric field changes in a, in a very specific way in order to respect Gauss law. And that's something that we really do not have. If you think about our Hubbard models, we have global symmetries, we have <coughs> conservation of magnetization, particle number, things like that. But these types of local symmetries we simply don't have. And um, yeah, so let me skip the idea of what we are actually trying to do. So it's a correlated hopping of fermions. Um, but this idea of needing a local symmetry motivates um, why we want to combine lattices, which we know how to work with large scale, um, uh, nice and uniform lattices with local control that we can add um, using tweezer beams. So this is the picture I showed you before. We have interfering uh, laser beams that generate Hubbard type um, Hamiltonians of physics. And then on top of that, we want to add local control that allows us to 
induce or inhibit tunneling very specifically by shining in additional laser beams. So in the end, it will be a combination of optical lattices and local control that allows us to do um, the implementation of lattice gate theories. And we have decided to work with Eterbium because Eterbium has um, clock states. It has a ground and meter stable excited state, which we can essentially treat as two independent species. And uh, so we can implement this type of Hamiltonian with a single atomic species and play with the internal states and state dependent potentials so in order to realize these more complicated uh, Hamiltonians. And um, this is the machine. Uh, so it's a very simple one. We have an AOSense uh, open source. Uh, it's a single chamber design. We have a simple glass cell where we do um, a mod with me or track on the narrow cooling line of Eterbium. And then from there, we directly load into the lattice. So we also want uh, to increase the cycle time um, by directly loading into the lattice and then getting rid of the entropy of the system by rearranging the atoms with optical tweezers. And just to show you uh, one picture from our lab, so this is one array uh, that we made, um, our, like a five by five array using uh, crystal optical deflectors. Here in this case with bosonic ethereum atoms where each blue dot is essentially one ethereum atom. We have a statistic loading, so this is an average image, but if you look at, uh, at the video on each image, you would see a few ethereum atoms trapped in there. And uh, so this is the lattice, uh, the internal structure that I mentioned, so we have the ground in meter stable excited clock state. So this yellow line indicates the ultra narrow clock transition. And these two states uh, would implement our two different species in the lattice. And just to show you that we can actually work uh, with these states, this is our um, clock spectroscopy data. So here we got a line of about uh, 30 hertz. Now I know Jun Yi was here last week, so <laughs> that might not sound very impressive. Um, <laughs> For someone that uh, has worked with alkali atoms up to this point, we were very happy to see this at 30 hertz line width. And uh, we also improved it since then a bit. So we went down to as narrow as about two hertz so far. Um, yeah, so this is actually very nice. And uh, we have a few ideas actually also to uh, use um, these other internal states of Ethereum 171 and F states for uh, more quantum information type applications and um, some ideas of actually moving into the high precision spectroscopy <coughs> domain uh, using, this, uh, using this atom. So if someone is interested in discussing that, I'm happy uh, to tell you more. Um, but at this point, I'm at the end. And uh, let me at least show you the people who have actually done all this work. So there's our cesium team, um, which involves quite a lot of people. They are not all here anymore. The main people are now uh, Simon, uh, Alex, and Julian who are working on the quantum gas microscope setup. And for the hexagonal lattice, it's mostly um, Christoph, Alex, and Raphael who have worked on the edge state uh, dynamics. And we have actually two uh, Eterbium teams. Um, so here, uh, Nelson has now moved to Gila. Uh, so he's working with Adam Kaufman. And the main PhD students are Tim and Etienne. And um, we also have a Rydberg project that is coming up. So thank you very much. Questions? Uh, so this uh, blockade engineering depends on the atomic species. So it's like there's anything special for fusion compared to other Um, not really. The reason why we decided to go for season is because it allows us to also tune the interactions. Mm -hmm. Season has a nice special resonance that we can use. I was wondering if you, when you look at the network that you generate after training, if you learn anything new about like your imaging or about the, like your experiments in general from the... Mm, not necessarily, yeah. I mean, maybe not necessarily something new, but um, we can see, or we can do a few tests in order to see if the network is really working well. So for instance, what we did is you can start with this bottleneck and just put one, a uh, single one in the array and then look at the decoder part of the network and see if it gives you the point spread function back. So this is one thing that we did. And the other thing is you can, uh, depending on the, the filling of this array, computing back the reconstructed uh, density distribution allows you to see if it learns the super radiance or this collective light emission phenomena um, in your system. And indeed you see that there's a nonlinear behavior on the, on the filling 
if you look at the brightness of the box. So it, it indeed managed to learn uh, pseudo rating. Yeah. Um, what would have been the choice of terbium over strontium? Um, in this case, so in principle, you could also use strontium. We went uh, for ethereum because we want to use the two node wavelengths where you um, generate potentials that only one of the two clock states sees. And there are a lot of question marks on the particular plot of the ACP reversibility, but from our estimates, it seems that the tune out points are further away from resonance in the case of ethereum as we have strontium. So we think it may suffer less from scattering. Uh, have anyone uh, done thought about like including spin degree of freedom uh, into the simulation uh, uh, work code items so you can achieve something like spin quad map? Um, yes, so there are many uh, different examples on how to include spin. So this is typically different uh, demand states or different internal levels. So for instance, um, if you go to the n equal one filling, then the remaining dynamics would be given by internal state dynamics. Super exchange, so you can implement spin hamiltonian. You can also do something like spin hall effect, and the easiest way to see that is that you can use two different internet states and use a driving protocol where the churn number, the sign of the churn number depends on the internet state. So this has been done. Um, so, uh, first of all, uh, that uh, edge transport data has been a dream. Uh, I guess for the whole field, for those of you who don't know, for a very long time. Uh, it's one of the things that I proposed to do uh, when I was going to be faculty. So that didn't work out. But, <laughs> but, so, so congratulations on that. That's really awesome. Uh, I did want to ask, does the blob smear out less if you prepare it at finite momentum, or finite quasi momentum, before you start the dynamics? Um, yeah, that's a very good question. So it does not. So what we see is mostly dispersion, I think, in the fact that the edge um, is also finite width. So it does actually acquire dispersion from the band, it hybridizes a little bit with the band. But uh, this question about finite momentum is actually interesting because the data that I was showing is actually from this anomalous regime, where you have an edge state at all energies. If you try to do the same thing in the high regime, what have you it's very, uh, it's much more fragile, and you need to put it to find a momentum in order to see anything to happen. Cool. Thank you. Oh, Monica's in the back. Hi. Hey, hey, Monica. I don't know if my glasses are on. <laughs> um, uh, I was wondering whether you looked at, um, you mentioned tuning interactions. I'm wondering whether you looked at that at all in the honeycomb lattice with this nice topological. In the, in the honeycomb? The states. Yeah. yeah. So in the honeycomb, um, not yet in detail. In the beginning, when we started to look at the edge state dynamics, um, we had finite interactions, and uh, the system was quickly blowing up. So meaning that we, we couldn't get a very nice overlap with the edge mode. And what we have not tried is to first uh, prepare the edge mode and then maybe to the interactions to see some non-linear effects. This is not this we haven't tried yet. Yeah, in the book, uh, engineering. So don't you need to worry about heating, especially when the frequ driving frequency is low? Um, so there are, there are two different regimes. So the, the case where the driving frequency is, is very, very low, close to adiabatic, then it's actually all fine. Um, in the case where we are in the order of the energy scale of the system or even larger, then in principle, you have to worry about heating. Um, for interacting systems, in a non interacting case, it's, it's still um, quite good. If you want to go to the interacting system, what we're planning to do in the cesium experiment is to have large enough Hubbard interactions so that you can always find uh, like a gap for the driving frequency to not have resonant scattering. So this in principle should work as well. Great, thank you. So I'm, I'm interested in this neural network idea. It's amazing that you even could get it to 96%. But I guess I'm kind of wondering, you said that your convolution kernel is like three sites by three sites, right? If you allow it to try to learn a bigger kernel or you try to allow it to learn like a local intensity for your cooling beam or something, is there a possibility to do better? Do you think it's fundamental? 
So we have since then played around with the parameters of the network quite a bit. And it seems, so we need to investigate this a little bit more, but it seems that what we are getting right now is fundamentally limited by the finite signal to noise that we have in our system. So we are trying to push uh, the signal to noise in order to see if then we can increase the density. Other questions? Right, well, let's take one.